Hello everyone, and welcome to Ultimate Fanfiction, so we are back with an interesting movie on what if Naruto awakens three bloodlines of the greatest clans the elemental nations. Here is a quick summary. Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, who thought of himself as nothing more than an outcast, is about to get a shocking surprise in the form of three bloodlines of the greatest clans the elemental nations have ever known. But before we start, I just want to remind you to please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button if you enjoy my content. Let's start the story. The Beginning 8,100 years ago, in the beginning, when several demons roamed the earth and the human race was still young. When there was very few of the human race of great repute. But there were only two great enough to mention, the first a great man, martial artist, and pervert by the name of Mutan Roshi also known as the Kame Sennine, Turtle Hermit one of the first wielders of ki or kai, physical energy, and the creator of the kamehameha technique, the second a kind and beautiful female psychic by the name of Jenke, one of the first wielders of reiki, spiritual energy, and the creator of the spirit wave technique. Now that we know a little about the two great people from the human race let's move on to the demons of great repute, the first are the original nine great biju, tailed beast, that the only one worth mentioning of this group is the first Kiyubi no Kitsune also known as the Kiyubi no Yoko, one of the nine great demon lords. The second a powerful Mizoku by the name of Ryzen and last, but definitely not least a female demon named Makoro, both a great demon king, queen of the lands in Makai, demon world, that they ruled. These five were the most powerful beings on earth, but only at this moment in time. Nearly 400 years later is when things really got started and several more powerful people started appearing. The first a great and powerful man named Sun Goku a person from a proud warrior race of aliens called Saiyans, he landed on Earth 350 years ago when he was only a baby just a few weeks old and was found by an old man named Sun Gohan, who was once a student of Master Roshi, who adopted him and gave him the name Goku. He was later trained by Master Roshi himself and became the first master of the body user and the protector of the Dragon Balls. The second a powerful Mizoku half-breed by the name of Yurameshi Yusuke, born human 250 years ago at the age of 16 he became the first apprentice and successor of Genke. He later found out he was part Mizoku demon with his ancestral dad being none other than King Ryzen himself, he later became the first master of the spirit user and wielder of three different energies, Reiki, spirit energy, yoki, demon energy, and sakoki, sacred energy. The third a powerful yoko called Yoko Karama also known as Minamino Shuichi, son of the first Kiyubi no Yoko he became renowned as the greatest thief in Makai 300 years ago he was later hunted down and nearly killed, to make sure he didn't die he went to human world and merged with a developing human baby saving his life, but also becoming Minamino Shuichi in the process. The fourth and last a fire ice demon hybrid with a jagan implant named Hiei, born 300 years ago from a male fire demon and a female ice demon he was outcast from the ice demon village for being born from a male. He became famous for being the first to master the darkness flame technique and later married the demon queen Makoro. 2000 years later, the goddesses Kami, Yami, and Tozi seeing the first two of the legendary Keke Jenke come into being decided to create a bloodline of their own that was for the eyes. When they were done creating it they realized that it was too powerful to give to just any human being so they decided to put two locks on it, one so only people with pure intentions and a pure heart could activate it, and the other for its final level to be activated which is unknown what its requirement is. The goddesses then created a human being that could use it and after all that they decided to give it a name, they all thought of many names for the bloodline that could come to a stalemate with the bloodline of both the spirit and the body, until they finally decided on its name, the Omnigan. Then the goddesses named the human they made to wield it and the first user of the bloodline his name being, Namikaze Tenchi. And that's how the last of the three great clans were formed them being known as, the Sun Clan, the Urameshi Clan, and the Namikaze Clan. These three clans although each had their differences and different Keke Genke they were actually very great allies and friends with one another their clans were such great friends that every so often they'd have a great tournament with each other for fun usually once every five years. 4,600 years later, throughout the years the three great clans and their founders Goku, Yusuke, and Tenchi all had very peaceful lives, they discovered Chakra and were having a great life living in the mountains far from civilization, but the founders knew their time among the living was coming to an end and they knew that they only had about 200 years of life left. 
During that time Tenchi had found a young orphaned boy who would later be known as the Rakudo Senen he took him in and taught the boy, but he only taught him about chakra and how to use it. After a few years of training him the now young man decided to go on a journey around the continent soon be known as the Elemental Nations, but before leaving on his journey he visited Tenchi on his deathbed where he gave him a gift, a dujutsu that soon became known by everyone as, the Rinnegan. During his journey he ran into the Jubi, ten-tailed beast, a monstrous demon that had stolen the other biju's power and taken it into itself making it one of the most powerful demons in the world. He fought it to protect everyone from the power-hungry demon and knowing that he couldn't kill the beast he sealed the beast's soul and power into himself becoming the first Jinchuriki, power of human sacrifice, and then using one of the special abilities granted to him by his dujutsu the Rinnegan and sealed its body into the moon that he recreated after it was destroyed long ago by Master Roshi. A few years after his epic battle with the Jubi he settled down with a beautiful woman and had two sons, while he taught people about chakra as he continued to try to make his ultimate wish happen which was to establish world peace something he knew he could probably not do in his lifetime, years pasted as he watched his sons grow into young men and probably the saddest part was watching his wife die. A few more years had pasted and he soon found himself on his deathbed, but before leaving the land of the living he wanted to give each of his sons a gift and have one of them succeed him in completing his ultimate wish. The gift he gave his oldest child were his eyes, his powerful chakra and spiritual energy. While he gifted his youngest child with his body, his powerful will and physical energy. After giving them their gifts he then told them he would now pick who would succeed him in finishing his goal in attaining world peace after that he asked them, what do you think the true key to attaining world peace is? His eldest son believed that power was the true key to attain peace, while his youngest son believed that love was the true key to attain peace. After them waiting a few minutes in the unbearable silence. In both anxiety and anticipation of who would succeed him, after another moment or two he then announced that his youngest son would succeed him and not long after his announcement he then split up the Jubi's chakra into nine pieces that would return to the nine bijus the Jubi had stolen its power from and that later would become greatly known by the rest of the elemental nations, shortly afterwards he passed away taking the Jubi's soul with him. The older brother was overcome by bitterness, jealousy, and envy that he wasn't chosen to succeed their father so he attacked his younger brother thus beginning their war with each other and that their feud with each other would continue on through their descendants the older brothers being known as, the Uchiha clan, while the younger brothers became known as, the Senju clan and thus began the clan wars. One thousand years later, after a while the clan wars stopped and the five great ninja villages began being constructed and the three great clans were slowly being forgotten over time as more clans appeared one of note as the Uzumaki clan that was born from one member each of two of the great clans them being the Sun clan and the Urameshi clan. The clan was born when a member from each of the clans fell in love with each other thus creating a new clan with the abilities of both the Sun clan and the Urameshi clan and so when it was born it rose to become one of the great clans, thus upping the number of the clans from three to four. The clan made its home in Uzu no Kuni, land of whirlpools, creating the village known as Uzu Shiogakir no Sado, village hidden among the whirling tides. The village was also known as Shoju no Sado, the village of longevity, and the ninja in the clan were renowned for their fuenjutsu, sealing techniques, skills. The ninjas worth mentioning at the time were Senju Hashirama the main founder of Konoha, Uchiha Madara who helped found Konoha, and Senju Tobarama Hashirama's younger brother. As more years passed the Sun and Urameshi clan slowly died out and the Daichiji Ninkai Taizen, first shinobi world war, started and ended a few years after it began. Shortly after it the Dainiji Ninkai Taizen, second shinobi world war, started. In this war led by several influential people there were a few great shinobi and kunoichi born the most notable being Hitaki Sakuma or the Konoha no Shiroi Kiba, White Fang of the Leaf, as he became known as during the war and the slightly more famous ninja the Sanin also known as the Densetsu no Sanin, legendary three ninja trained by the Sandame Hokage, third Hokage, Serutobi Hiruzen himself and named by Sancho no Hanzo, Hanzo of the Salamander, the three ninja being Senju Tsunade. Orochimaru, and Jiraiya. During the war these three ran into some orphans in AIM that asked them if they could teach them ninjutsu their names being Konan, Nagato, and Yahiko. Jiraiya decided to stay behind and train them for a little while. While they're training them he found out that Nagato possessed the Rinnegan believing that he was to be the Yogan no Ko, child of the prophecy, 
from the prophecy he heard from the great toad sage on Mount Myoboku thinking this he trained them a little more than he'd intended to. Also during the time he was training them he was writing his first book which he got some inspiration for from talking with Nagato. The story was soon titled, Dokonjo Ninden, Tale of the Utterly Gutsy Shinobi. Though the book was not a big seller and the story was not finished it was still a good book. When he finished training them he left them while leaving Nagato a copy of the book. Shortly before the war ended Uzu no Kuni, Land of Whirlpools, was destroyed and almost all of the Uzumaki clan killed because the other villages feared them because of their skill in Fuinjutsu the only survivor being a young girl saved by Konoha Ninja and taken back to the village because of their alliance with them. The girl's name was Uzumaki Kashina who unknown to most of the village was the second Jinchuriki of the Kayubi no Kitsune, the first being her ancestor Uzumaki Mito the wife to the Shodem Hokage, first Hokage. Wanting to be a ninja she joined the ninja academy in the village. During the academy she said that she wanted to be the first female Hokage, the kids laughed at her declaration and gave her the nickname Tomato because of the fact that she had a slightly round face and red hair this prompted her to lash out and pummel the kids who teased her for it. This, in addition to her red hair flowing wildly around, earned her the nickname of Akai Chishio no Habanero, Red Hot Blooded Habanero. Sometime after arriving in Konoha and becoming a Kunoichi, Kashina was kidnapped by Kumogakure ninja who wanted to make use of her special chakra. As they escorted her to Kumo she secretly plucked and left behind strands of her red hair to mark her trail in the hopes that someone would find her. Namikaze Minato, one of her classmates that Kashina believed to be a wimp, was the only one to pick up on this. After rescuing her he informed her that he had always admired her red hair. Since then Minato had proved himself to be anything but a wimp, and liked the one thing she'd hated about herself. Kashina fell in love with him after that, now considering her red hair as the Unmei no Akai Ito, red thread of fate, that had brought them together. Shortly afterwards the war ended and then peace reigned for a few years before the Daisanji Ninkai Taizen, Third Shinobi World War, started during this war several great shinobi appeared the greatest and also the one responsible for ending it being Namikaze Minato also known as Konoha no Kiroi Senko, Yellow Flash of the Leaf, and the last true member of the great Namikaze clan. Another one of note was the great Kunoichi, Uzumaki Kashina also known as Barati Shinku no Akari, Bloody Crimson Fury, and the secret wife of Namikaze Minato. Another from Sanagakure called Sasori also known as Akasuna no Sasori, Sasori of the Red Sand, and last but not least a young man called Hitaki Kakashi, who was promoted to Janin and gained his Sharingan from his teammate Obito Uchiha when he died during the mission to destroy the Kanabi Bridge and also gained fame as Kopi Ninja no Kakashi, Kopi Ninja Kakashi, he was also the student of Namikaze Minato. The three AIM orphans after being trained by Jiraiya became AIM Shinobi shortly before the war then started a group of people that believed in their beliefs, a few months after creating it they were contacted during the war by Hanzo claiming to want to talk about peace, but really he viewed them as a threat and when they arrived they were confronted by Hanzo who had the assistance of Shimura Danzo. They captured Conan and using her as a hostage told Nagato to kill Yahiko if he wanted Conan to live. Nagato conflicted knowing he couldn't do it, but didn't want to lose Conan didn't know what to do and because he couldn't decide the choice was taken from him by Yahiko who impaled himself on the kanai held by Nagato. Yahiko with his final breath he told Nagato, survive Nagato because I believe that just like Jiraiya said you will become this world's savior. Devastated by the death of his friend he rescued Conan then afterwards the shinobi launched an attack that crippled his legs he then retaliated with the technique Kachiyose, Ghetto Mazo, summoning, demonic statue of the outer path. The technique then stabbed chakra receivers into his back. Then out of the mouth of the statue came a purple transparent dragon which enveloped several shinobi killing them instantly, but unfortunately before it could envelope Hanzo and Danzo they escaped, afterwards he slashed his headband. Then he became the man called Pain. Shortly after the war ended, and Minato was elected as the new Hokage by the Sandame and became the Yandaimi Hokage, fourth Hokage, of Konoha. A few weeks after his acceptance ceremony, his wife Kashina came to him while he was in his office doing the paperwork his position required him to do. When she arrived, he asked why she was there. The response he got was not something he was expecting. She had a few tears of happiness as she said, I'm pregnant, we're going to have a baby. Her voice full of happiness and he was caught so off guard by it he almost fainted luckily he didn't, but it was close. He was still shocked by what she'd said, 
but that shock soon turned to happiness as he walked around his desk and embraced her in a hug which she happily returned he then said, this is by far one of the best and happiest days of my life second only to the day I married you. After saying that Kashina shed even more tears as Minato kissed them away and afterwards kissed her on the mouth which she happily returned. Nine months later, during her pregnancy Kashina was kind of hectic between her odd cravings and mood swings Minato was having a very hard time with it all. To him it was all too much to handle, but he pushed through it and endured it not just for her but for the son or daughter she was carrying in her womb. They had decided not to find out what gender it was though they might for the next one. When she was in the last few months of her pregnancy Jiraiya showed up and that's when they both asked him if he wouldn't mind being his godfather so if anything happened to them he'd take care of their child. After hearing it he decided he'd take care of the kid and be his godfather should anything happen to them, but he hoped that nothing did. After that they asked that if it was a boy, if they could name him Naruto after the main character in his novel Dokonjo Ninden, Tale of the Utterly Gutsy Shinobi, he said that he didn't mind although he said that he came up with the name while he was eating ramen, but they didn't mind. Also during the pregnancy a special delivery room made a ways from the village so that while his most trusted doctors delivered the baby he could help by making sure the Kiyubi no Kitsune didn't escape the seal, as it would be at its weakest during it and could escape. A few days before she was due they moved her to the room made next to the delivery room that she could stay in until it was time. They were delivering the baby now and while they were doing that Minato was having a hard time making sure the Kiyubi didn't escape. After a few minutes of Kashina pushing while yelling and cursing at Minato with him keeping Kiyubi in the seal they heard a baby's cries the doctors then said it was a beautiful baby boy. Kashina and Minato were both very happy, but not even a minute after the doctor cut the umbilical cord a man appeared out of nowhere and grabbed Naruto stabbing the doctor that held him then said while pointing a kanai at Naruto, Namikaze step away from the Uzumaki or your son will die at the unfortunate age of one minute. Seeing that the Anbu didn't enter after the man entered he knew that the man must have killed them before he came in, acting quickly Minato ran toward the man and took Naruto back unfortunately this gave the man the time he needed to get to Kashina and teleport away. After finding a safe place to put Naruto he then teleported to Kashina and arrived just in time to save her before the Kiyubi killed her now that the man removed it from her. After saving her he teleported back to Naruto reuniting mother and son, then went to defend Konoha from the Kiyubi. Arriving in the beginning stages of its attack and after protecting the village from its Amari, menacing ball, he tried to reach the Sandame Hokage to inform him of what happened. He was stopped by the man who started it all, who he learned was Uchiha Madara, one of the founders of Konoha and the greatest traitor in the history of Konoha that was supposed to be dead, who tried to send him away with his Jikukan Ido, space-time migration, technique. Minato escaped but was followed by Madara. When the two began fighting, Minato struggled to hit Madara, Madara being intangible whenever he was not currently attacking by carefully timing his Hiroishin no Jutsu, flying thunder god technique. Minato was able to strike him during one of these rare moments and apply a seal for the Hiroishin no Jutsu to him, allowing him to teleport to Madara whenever he wanted. He then placed a Keiyaku Fuin, contract seal, on Madara to remove the Kiyubi from his control and forcing him to flee. When Minato returned to the village he found it in ruin and he then summoned Gamabunta to distract the Kiyubi long enough to teleport it away from the village to Naruto and Kashina's location. Kashina then restrained it and, already dying from the trauma of its removal, volunteered to have it sealed back into her body so that it would die with her. Distraught, Minato suggested instead using the Shiki Fujin, dead demon consuming seal, on the Kiyubi to weaken it and then seal the rest into Naruto. Kashina had objected to this since it would mean Minato's death and give Naruto a horrible, lonely life, but Minato insisted it was for the best since allowing the Kiyubi to resurrect itself, without a Jinchuriki to contain it, would inevitably cause harm to both Konoha and the Haino Kuni, land of fire. Also, Minato was convinced that Naruto was the Yogen no Ko, child of the prophecy, Jiraiya had once told him about and would need the Kiyubi's power to someday defeat Madara. After Minato used the Shiki Fujin on it, the Kiyubi then realized their intentions and tried to kill Naruto, but Minato and Kashina used their bodies to shield him before that could happen. While Kashina gave a few finals words to Naruto, Minato summoned Jeratora, gave him the key to the seal he would use on Naruto, and sent him to Jiraiya. After Kashina told Naruto how much his parents loved him, Minato sealed the rest of her chakra into Naruto so that she would be able to see him again when he was older, ending her life. 
He then sealed the Kiyubi into Naruto, since the Sandame Hokage had come to help. Minato used his last moments to request that Konoha think of Naruto as a hero, and not the container of the monster that caused so much death and destruction. Before he died he sealed his own chakra into Naruto so that he could someday see Naruto again too, specifically if ever the seal was about to break so that he could restore it. Unfortunately for Kashina, Minato, and Naruto that request would not be honored by the citizens of Konoha. The Sandame Hokage did his best to look out for Naruto. He informed the survivors of the Kiyubi's attack on Konoha of Minato's last wish, but only those who had been close to Minato were willing to regard Naruto as anything but the Kiyubi's Jinchuriki. Unable to change the minds of the populace, the Sandame Hokage forbid anyone from speaking of the Kyubi, hoping that those too young to remember the Kyubi's attack would not hate Naruto as the rest of the village did. He gave Naruto his mother's surname so that his relation to Minato would be kept a secret from Minato's enemies. He otherwise did his best to give Naruto a comfortable life despite Naruto having no parents and being made into an outcast by the rest of the village. Though giving him a comfortable life was very hard because of the beatings he would sometimes receive, that were always worse on his birthday and that Naruto would never be told about his parents' identities until he knew that he was ready. With Minato's death, the Sandame was forced to resume his position as Hokage, a role he'd fill until he was able to find a replacement of Minato's caliber. Minato himself became regarded as the village's hero and, indeed, one of the greatest ninja Konoha had ever produced, so much so that villagers would regret his death whenever tragedy struck the village. Because Minato was never able to tell anyone what happened during the Kiyubi's attack, villagers were forced to make their own explanations. Jiraiya recognized that Minato would not have sealed the Kiyubi into his own son unless he had a good reason and that Minato intended Naruto to gain control of the Kiyubi, but could never satisfactorily explain why. Although Naruto had no idea about his relation to Minato for all his life, he appeared to greatly admire the Yandaimi Hokage, considering him a hero who gave his life for the village. Yandame's Head, Hokage Monument. Present. Now that we've seen what's happened up to this point in time let's get back to the story's main character and hero, Naruto, as he sat upon the Yandaimi's head watching the day end in his favorite place in the village to go when he just wanted to get away and think. The current things he was thinking about was why the villagers outcast him, trashed his apartment, and beat him, as he tried to think of why they did it he failed to notice the mob that was forming not far behind. The mob consisted of mostly civilians, but there were a few shinobi. A few seconds after forming and wanting a chase out of young Naruto so they could he some fun in their fox hunt, before they beat him to death, they yelled, there's the demon brat let's get him. As soon as Naruto heard that he quickly turned around and spotted them immediately knowing what would happen if they caught him, knowing this he ran before they could surround him. He ran down the streets as fast as he possibly could listening to their cries of hatred and because he knew the village streets very well he didn't get caught by run into a dead end alley, but unfortunately as he ran he didn't notice that he ran into the part of the village that was being remodeled, one wrong turn and he ran into a dead end. Hoping to escape the ally before the mob blocked it he ran to the entrance, but wasn't fast enough to get there in time and was trapped. Coo coo coo. Did you really think we'd let get away you little monster? One of them asked voice dripping with cruelty and anticipation of what was to come. Another laughed, now that's really funny, ha ha ha. Now let's finish what the Yandaimi started. Another yelled getting cheers of agreement. After that shout the worst beating of Naruto's life began the civilians beat him, burned him, stabbed him, and broke his bones all the while calling him horrible names, the things that he was stabbed with were everyday tools and anything else they could find. The only bones they broke was luckily only a few ribs, but they did grab and dislocate his right shoulder because he was using the arm to slightly protect himself, the other arm was being held down and burned with torches by others. The people beating him took pleasure in his cries of pain, for help, and for them to stop even though he knew they wouldn't listen. Half an hour later the beating stopped because several civilians were getting both tired and bored, because Naruto was no longer struggling or crying out in pain, so the shinobi of the group decided to take him to the forest between the village and the village walls, dump him there and hope he died there. After the shinobi dumped him in the forest he slowly got to his feet cringing every so often from his injuries, once he was on his feet he went to a tree and relocated his shoulder then slowly headed back to the village. On his way, he saw a masked man running towards him on his shoulder was a child tied up and probably gagged. Even though he was injured and bleeding he knew he couldn't just let this man kidnap the child he was carrying, 
so when he got close he tackled the man surprising him and knocking him down causing him to drop his precise cargo. Naruto got up and when he did he saw that the child the man was carrying was a girl his or about his age she had dark blue almost black hair with lavender white eyes and was looking at him with tears in them, that just cried for him to help her. When the man got up he looked around for the person that attacked him and saw that it was a badly injured kid, then said to him, get out of here kid I've got a girl to deliver and I don't need you getting in the way. If you do, I'll finish what the people who did that to you did. The response he got was not the one he wanted, I won't let you kidnap this cute girl. I'll stop you no matter what it takes even if I die. The girl blushed slightly at his comment despite the situation she was in, angry at the response given got he immediately got a kanai from his pouch and threw it at him, Naruto barely got out of the way where it landed at his feet. Seeing that he'd missed he decided to kill him up close considering how time constricted he was so removing another one and he ran towards him. Naruto having picked up the kanai from the ground, saw the attack and knew he couldn't move out of the way in time he held the kanai up hoping to at least injure the man attacking him. Seeing this pathetic attempt to injure him the man moved slightly to the side, he then got to the kid and stabbed him in the gut. After seeing the kid fall to his knees he turned to the girl and started walking towards her so he could get her and get going, when his back was turned Naruto threw the kanai he was holding as hard as he could hitting him in the neck, with enough force to pierce the skin and stabbing him in his jugular vein, luckily giving him a fatal wound. After being stabbed he turned, while hold his bleeding neck, to Naruto and took out another kanai in an attempt to kill him as well, but unfortunately for him he never got the chance to throw it. Naruto seeing him fall to the ground he pulled the kanai from his gut and slowly crawled over to the girl, after untying her and removing the gag he was tackled by her as she began crying into his chest not knowing what to do he just hugged her and said, it's alright now you don't have to cry he won't be taking you anywhere. She just continued crying then sobbed out, you w were already i injured when you f found m me, but ev even though you were y you still are rescued me g getting h hurt even m more in the pro process, why? The response he gave being, I couldn't just stand by and let someone get kidnapped when I could have done something to stop it, especially someone as cute as you. She moved her face further into his chest to hide her blush and started sobbing more. Shortly after this he asked, my name's Uzumaki Naruto, what's yours? She continued crying then sobbed out, H Hyuga H Hanada. He then said, that's a very beautiful name. When he said that she blushed even more than before creating a new shade of red, shortly after that the sandame arrived with a squad of anbu and hanada's father when they arrived seeing the corpse of the shinobi with a badly naruto wounded on the ground hugging a crying hanada nearby was a bit odd of a sight to see seeing them he sat up with some difficulty considering and said hi gigi how are you he then passed out from both exhaustion and blood loss seeing this hirazan immediately rushed to him hanada's father did as well not just to check on his daughter but also the boy that saved her, as Hirazan checked over Naruto he saw that he was bleeding very badly and needed to get to the hospital immediately. Turning to Hanada's father who was done checking his daughter seeing that besides the blood on her clothes she was okay, he said in a very urgent voice, Hiyashi can you help me get Naruto to the hospital he needs to get there, now. I'll have some of the Anbu take Hanada home while we do that. Before Hiyashi could answer Hanada still crying said in a worried voice, I want to go to the H hospital with N Naruto kun, I'm the one responsible for him as saving me when he was already and injured. After hearing that Hiyashi said, I'll help you get him there Hokage sama. Hanada are you sure you want to go with him? Hanada nodded with not a bit of hesitation, seeing her response he sighed while Hiruzen told half the Anbu to take the dead shinobi to Anbu headquarters and tell him who sent him after he was finished at the hospital. The other half was told to bring her with them and they began racing to the hospital with Naruto and Hanada in tow. When they arrived, Hiruzen immediately got Naruto's personal doctors and nurses, the only good ones that would treat him properly. He was soon taken into the operating room to get treated for all of the injuries he sustained. During that time Hiruzen, Hiyashi, and Hanada sat in the waiting room, Hanada still in tears hoping Naruto-kun made it. Hiyashi waited in silence while silently hoping the boy made it so he'd be able to thank him for saving his daughter, and Hiruzen was hoping he made it as well so he didn't have to live the rest of his life in the guilt that he couldn't protect Naruto as well as letting both Minato and Kashina down. After an hour and a half of waiting which felt like an eternity to the three, the surgery light went off indicating that the doctors were done and would be out soon to tell them the results good or bad. Just as they predicted a doctor exited the room and when he turned to them he had a small smile on his face making them know he had good news to tell, 
he then said, he'll make it, you all got him here just in time. At this all three of them were relieved. Hinata was now crying tears of joy that he's alive. Hiyashi was both relieved and glad they got him there in time, and Hiruzen let out a sigh of relief that he made it. Then the doctor's smile turned into a slight frown as a sad look appeared on his face as he announced, unfortunately, he's in a coma now and we have no idea when he'll wake up from it. When they heard this the three became very sad. Hinata was still crying with tears of sadness that he was now in a coma because he saved her. Hiyashi was also sad that the boy that saved his daughter was in a coma because of his injuries, and Hiruzen was both sad and confused, sad that Naruto was in a coma and confused with why he was in one because he knew the Kyubi wouldn't allow it. Shortly after receiving both the good and bad news on Naruto Hiyashi stood then turned to Hinata and said, come on Hinata, let's go home you need some rest after all that's happened tonight. She slowly nodded and got up slowly still crying. Hiyashi seeing this he decided to carry her home so when she was standing he bent down and picked her up, then the two slowly walked home. After the two were gone Hiruzen turned back to the doctor and said, I want to talk to you in private. The doctor nodded, and then both he and Hiruzen made their way towards his office. Shortly after they arrived Hiruzen put up a privacy barrier after that he then asked, how is it that Naruto is in a coma, I know that the Kyubi wouldn't allow it. So why is he in one? Little did he know the doctor was just as stumped as he was. I don't know Hokage-sama, I'm just as stumped as you are now, but I will tell you this while we were saving the boy's life we noticed that the whisker marks on his face were slowly fading away, and when we'd finished they were almost completely gone. We don't know what's causing this, but we are working on it, sir. We've already taken some blood, bone, tissue, and chakra samples that the others are probably putting through several tests now, and I should probably join them soon to help," the doctor said. Do you think this could be the Kyubis doing as well? Hiruzen asked. I don't think so sir because besides the chakra we felt from it when he arrived, which mysteriously disappeared as soon as he arrived, that's it. While we were saving him we didn't feel any from it, so I highly doubt that it has anything to do with what's happening. Besides we've usually felt chakra from it through the entire time we're healing him, that's why we were very worried he wouldn't make it when we stopped feeling it when he was bought in, he replied. Hearing this he was now worried on what was happening to Naruto and what they would do with him until he woke up, after thinking for a while he asked, what do you think we should do with Naruto while you're doing the tests on his blood, bones, tissues, and chakra, and until he wakes up. Thinking for a little while he came to decision on what to do with him, and answered, I think we should put him into his high security hospital room that he's got in the hospital with two Anbu guards at the door with only his personal doctors and nurses allowed in. While at the same time we check up on him every week, unless something happens, to check for any physical changes on him while taking care of him and every month and a half take new blood, bone, tissue, and chakra samples to test. We'll also keep you updated as often as we can on his status, including if he happens to wake up at any time. Hiruzen thought about all the doctor said and he thought that was probably the best option at the moment, considering that by itself Naruto's high security room in the hospital was the safest room in the entire hospital that was designed specifically for Naruto's protection, but wasn't used very often because besides very serious injuries he was usually out of the hospital shortly after he was admitted and adding the Anbu there was just plain overkill. After thinking about everything else he suggested, he responded, all right we'll do that but I want you to know I'll be coming by to check on him every so often to make sure he's doing alright. I'll be by tomorrow, most likely with the Hyuga heiress Hanada because I'm sure she'll want to visit him during his stay here. She may even want to come by every so often like I am, but no I'll be telling her she has to be with me when she wants to visit him. That way we can keep any imposters from getting in to try and kill Naruto while he's in this coma of his, am I very clear on that Hiroshi? The doctor, now known as Hiroshi, nodded and replied, Yes sir Hokage-sama, I'll also make sure we try and find out what's happening to him as soon as possible. Shortly after that was said Hiruzen dropped the barrier and both of them left Hiroshi heading to the labs where the doctors and nurses were testing the samples they got, Hiruzen heading out of the hospital and back to his office. When he got there he pulled out his pipe and lit it with an E-rank level Katen Jutsu, slowly puffing on it and letting the smoke ease his mind he spoke aloud to himself what's happening to you Naruto and how will it affect your future as a shinobi? He said as he remembered all the times Naruto spoke of how he'd become the greatest shinobi in the world, as well as becoming the greatest Hokage Konoha's ever had. Unknown to him the changes Naruto was going through at this moment would not only turn him into one of the greatest warriors the world has ever known, but also one of its greatest saviors. Realm of the Goddesses, 
Before Naruto began his transformation the three goddesses were all conversing with each other on how they could help not only him, but the other Jinchuriki that were being mistreated, even though they knew they couldn't do much to help without interfering themselves. Though the goddesses did keep an eye on Naruto more than the others, because they knew he would be the one to save the world. They didn't think he would ever activate the three greatest Keke Jenke in the history of the world that he had coursing through his veins. So when they felt the powerful shockwave of them all activating at once they were all both shocked and surprised that they did, but after they got over that they all had large smirks on their faces as they now knew how they could help him, that help being training him in the use of his keke jenke, along with a few more things, and with any luck he'd help out the others that needed help. So they were now getting everything they needed ready for his training. The first thing being the special training dimension they were creating for they knew that because the bloodlines had been dormant for generations that his body would be resting for a few years as the bloodlines shaped it into the perfection holders of the bloodlines had. So in the dimension they were creating he could not only train his bloodlines. For his spirit would already be in the form his body would take after it was done transforming, and mind, but his body as well allowing it to not fall behind when he returned to his body because if they didn't all of the bodily related training he'd do here would be useless and he'd have to work to get his body back up to speed when he left. It also had more gravity than Earth to help him train his body ten times more to be precise. Along with that time within it moved faster than in reality, where one hour in reality is two days in the dimension, but even though time moves faster there his spirit will still remain the age of his body, so he gets years of training and will not have aged that much at all, a plus for his training instead of just having the few years they had for his body to transform. The next thing was the food, water, weapons, and scholastic scrolls. Though he technically didn't need food or water here it was still good to have something to eat and drink even if you didn't need it plus the nutrients from the food would be transferred to his body allowing it to quicken the transformation slightly. And the variety of different weapons they'd made for him to train with would make any weapons user drool for they'd made every weapon you could possibly imagine and even some you wouldn't, all for him to train with, and the scholastic scrolls were so he could learn subjects such as history, economics, etc. along with that were several regular jutsu and medical jutsu along with both elemental and sub-elemental jutsu that he wouldn't be taught. The last and most important thing were the trainers that'd train him not just in jutsu, but in knowledge and life as well, they then made their decision on the people to train him. Knowing they could always summon others if needed, so Kami and Yami then summoned the people who'd be training him as soon as they did spiritual blue flames appeared in front of them and disappeared soon after leaving five silhouettes four of them male and one female. The only thing that you could see clearly were their eyes. Two of the men had sapphire blue eyes, one of them had black, while the other had brown eyes with slight slits, and the only female of the group had dark violet eyes. The five were looking around in slight confusion, until their eyes landed on the three goddesses. Hello everyone my name's Kami and the reason we've summoned you five here so that you can train a young boy in the arts that you all specialize in, that boy's name being, Namikaze Uzumaki Naruto and we all hope that you'll train him till he's almost as good as if not better than you, yourselves. Kami said, the five were shocked at the request from the goddess in front of them, and before any of the others could answer, one of the blue-eyed men spoke. Excuse me Kami-sama, but why must we train this boy you obviously have a great interest in? He asked. The others had wondered that as well, while they really didn't care about training the boy or not. Because he is not only the last heir of the three great clans, but he's also the last user of their great Keke Jenke. As soon as she said this the five all had wide eyes. Not only that, but he will also become a great hero. So will you five train the boy or not? She finished, as soon as she'd finished they all were nodding there and replied at once, I'll do it. As soon as they'd heard that they all smiled time to go get the reason they were doing all this and then all three of them disappeared, leaving the five there to converse among themselves until they returned with the boy. Naruto's Mindscape While all that was happening Naruto was exploring the sewer that was his mind. He was very confused as to how he got there, I mean come on how often do you wake up and find yourself in a sewer? So he was walking around the dimly lit tunnels until he saw one that had a lot more light coming from it, thinking he'd found the way out he ran down it, but when he came out of it he was in a large well-lit room with a giant barred gate that was closed and had a piece of paper in the middle of it with the kanji for seal on it. He was barely out of the tunnel still hidden in the shadows of the room, when two giant red eyes that had slits instead of the usual round pupil, as soon as they appeared a loud booming manly sounding voice with a slight feminine undertone rang out, who's there? I know you're there I can feel you there, come out now I, 
the great Kiyubi no Kitsune, command it, it yelled. Naruto not knowing what to do now that he was caught by this supposedly dead demon decided to do what it had asked, so he put on a brave front and walked out of the shadows and into the room more and replied, here I am, Kiyubi. Not showing an ounce of fear. Once he was out of the shadows the Kiyubi's eyes widened at what it was seeing, there in front of it was a tall boy wearing no shirt with slightly shredded pants, but that wasn't what caught its attention. What did was that he was very ripped for his age. The large muscles were built for both speed and strength, his skin had a tan coloration to it and was form fitted to his muscles giving it a rippled look and enhancing his looks, his eyes were a dark sapphire blue color with slight slits much like its own, his hair was dirty golden blonde, slightly past shoulder length and very spiky, and one of the things that was shocking was that he had a brown monkey tail swaying behind him. One of the things was most shocking for it though was the dark blue tattoos that covered most of his body. On his forearms was a lightning-like tattoo that wrapped around it twice diagonally and from what little it could see the same tattoo was wrapped around his lower legs as well. On his shoulders was a large circle that covered most of it and slightly below it was a triangular shape that had the bottom curved to form to the bottom of the circle with the two corners almost halfway up at the sides curved around the bottom side of it and inward slightly until coming to a point just above the middle part of his upper arm. On his chest in the middle of it near the neck was a tattoo that looked like a curvy slit fused a curvy triangle with one on top of the other the slit was curved over the collarbones following them with the tips ending a little bit before the shoulders the middle of curved downward at the bottom of the curve was where the bottom of the triangle was fused to at the bottom of it was curved similar to the slit with the corners ending slightly before the slits ends the sides of the triangle curved along its bottom half until it neared the middle where it curved downward coming to a point near the bottom of his pectoral muscles. Also on his chest were two diagonal lines parallel to each other with lower one smaller than the one on top on his pectoral muscles near the shoulders with bottoms ending just below his armpits and below his arms and the tops ending just below the edges of the triangular tattoo at the top of the chest. The next set of tattoos were on his neck above the Adam's apple that consisted of three upside down triangles. The middle one's bottom was at the top of the Adam's apple and had a circular curve to at the sides just below the bottom were curved inward slightly and straightened out as it went down coming to a point just below the adam's apple the beside the middle one were very similar just opposite of other the bottoms were diagonal with the top corner was the one next the middle triangle and it was just below the corners of the middle one and the lower one a little below the upper one next comes the sides the one next to the middle triangle went straight down to where it ended just above the middle one's point the outer side had a slight inward curve to it near the bottom that straightened out that connected at the end of the other side and the last sets were three small fang-like marks. Under his eyes on the edge of his cheeks with the inner two were right side up and the outer one upside down the upper inside one had a wider and shorter than its lower counterpart its tip ending slightly above the bottom of the outer one while the lower one was thinner and longer stopping starting just below the upper one and ending a little ways above the jawline and the outer one started at the corner of the lower inside one with its point ending slightly above the upper one. Basically Yusuke's Mizoku tattoos with the addition of the one on his forearms on Naruto's lower legs. When Kiyubi saw them it knew immediately what they signified, this boy was part Mizoku demon. After it saw who had disturbed it as it knew the only one that could was its new container, it asked, why are you here and what do you want, boy? Naruto seeing that it wanted to talk to him he asked politely, well I was just walking around here when I found this place. But since you asked I'd like to know why you're alive when I've heard that you died five years ago and where we are. The Kiyubi was at first surprised at his politeness, but when it heard the first part of his question it started to laugh before answering his question, ha 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 ha. I can't be killed by the humans in this day and age, the only humans I know that could have killed me lived a long time ago, so the only way for humans to get rid of us nowadays is to seal us into a container of some sort, as to where we are this is your mindscape. When Naruto heard this was his mindscape and Kiyubi could only be sealed into a container, he put two and two together figuring out that he was its container and once he figured it out he now knew why almost all the adults in the village hated him and called him the hateful names they did. After coming to that shocking revelation he got angry at both Hiruzen for not telling him and Kiyubi for doing what it did, but before his anger got the best of him and he lashed out at Kiyubi, his pure and heartfelt mind came up with a suggestion that he couldn't argue with ask them why they did what they did, so with that in mind he asked, Kiyubi why did you attack the village? Kiyubi thought that after it told him what he'd wanted to know and he figured out that he was its container he would lash out at it like most people would have considering all it knew of what he'd been through because of it, 
but here he was doing the exact opposite and asking it why it attacked his village. It was now both surprised and happy, surprised that he did it and happy that he didn't lash out at it. After getting over both it decided to both tell him and transform into its Hanyu form so he wouldn't have to continue looking up at it as they talked he deserved that much considering how nice and understanding he was being, with that in mind it said, very well I'll tell you why, but first let me slip into something more comfortable and so you won't have to keep looking up during our conversation. Naruto was surprised by what it said then soon after it did it started to glow red as it began to shrink, as it shrunk it began to take on a more human-like shape and soon after shrinking to a normal person's height the glow dissipated revealing one of the most beautiful women he had ever seen that had nine fluffy tails behind her and two fox ears on her head. She had a dark tan to her skin with long bright crimson red hair that reached just past her butt, her face was amazing it was heart-shaped with a button nose her eyes were the same red with slits that it was before but now they had red eyeliner and she had a luscious set of lips with red lipstick. Her chest had to be at least high D cup in size, she had a flat muscled stomach, and long luscious legs. After noticing all of that he noticed something that he wasn't paying enough attention to notice before, she's naked. He then immediately turned around with a cherry red face, wide eyes, and very embarrassed at seeing a woman naked, he then yelled, put some clothes on. Seeing his reaction along with what he shouted soon after had her giggling, she always loved to see a guy's reaction when she did that. She then created some clothes consisting of a no-sleeved kimono top with its shoulders halfway down her upper arms showing off a lot of cleavage and the bottom stopped just above her stomach, a leg-length slit skirt with the slit over the right leg and went from the bottom to the top of the skirt, and no footwear to speak of. She then replied, I'm dressed you can turn back around now. Oh, now that I think about it we don't know each other's names mine's Kiyomi, what's yours? After hearing her angelic voice say she was dressed he slowly turned around and seeing that while she was dressed now it was just barely better than when she'd been naked, he then answered her question, it's Uzumaki Naruto. Now are you going to answer the question I asked? When she heard that she knew that he was her previous container's son, after coming to that revelation she decided to answer his question so with a sad face she said, alright, I'll tell you now. You see I've been sealed in a container before too to be precise both women. My second container had been pregnant and was in labor. Which is the only time when a Jinchuriki's seal is at its weakest and even if we try to stay in it. As I tried to do, we can't because we're just too powerful to be contained. But then someone started to pull me out of her seal, here her face changed from sad to a look of pure hatred, the person pulling me out was one of my most hated enemies, Uchiha Madara, and shortly after he pulled me out he used that accursed Sharingan of his to put me under his control. Just imagine watching your body do things that you don't want to do like trying to kill your friend and container along with attacking your village for example. I had then gotten extremely pissed not just because Madara was using me like a puppet again, but because of all the ninja that were attacking me, even when I felt his control on me stop and the yandaimi appear I continued my rage induced rampage, he then summoned a giant toad to distract me long enough for him to teleport me and him away from the village, but even then I was still too pissed to stop what I was doing. He'd transported me to where my old and dying container was with her son, where she then restrained my pissed off form with chakra chains, but me still being too pissed to stop and knowing what they were going to do, that being seal me into her son, you. I then tried to kill you before they could do it, but they both used their bodies to protect you and soon after I was sealed into you by the yandaimi. That's what happened, but before you say anything, I want you to know that I'm really very sorry for both attacking your village and trying to kill you when you were nothing more than a baby along with all the pain you've been through because of me. When she'd finished explaining, she turned her head so she didn't have to look at him and have him see the slight tears in her eyes for what she'd done that night and what she'd caused him to go through for being sealed in him. After hearing what happened, how she'd been controlled by some Uchiha into attacking the village and was too pissed off after he lost his control on her to stop, so pissed off in fact that she'd tried to kill him as a baby, but after knowing that it wasn't really her fault and hearing her apologize for both and what he'd gone through, he couldn't really stay angry at her and decided to forgive her for what had transpired that night and what had happened since then. Seeing how sad she was now, he went up to and through the cage bars and wrapped her in a warm hug saying, I forgive you. Those three words and the hug was too much for her and she started to cry as she returned his hug, this continued for a few minutes until she finally stopped her crying, she then broke the hug and backed up a bit while wiping the few tears that she still had on her face before replying, thank you asterisk sniff asterisk thank you so very much. After she stopped crying and gave him her thanks, he decided to ask her the two questions he now had, 
I've got two new questions to ask. The first being you're a girl? When he said he two new questions he wanted to ask she got curious as to what they were, though she knew one would be about his parents, but as soon as he finished the first she got slightly angry at it, she then replied in an angry voice, yes and what's wrong with being a girl? What a woman can't be as strong as or stronger than a man is that what you're saying? As soon as Naruto heard her angry reply, he immediately started tripping over himself saying, no that's not what I meant, I uh, I meant, um. He continued to try to come up with something so she wouldn't hurt him for what he'd said. While Naruto was tripping over himself, Kiyomi still had an angry look on her face, but on the inside she was laughing her ass off at it. She'd known what he'd meant when he asked it, but she was still slightly angry at it. Deciding to give him a break she started giggling and said, he he he, it's alright I knew what you meant, but be careful when you ask a woman that in the future, not many will be as lenient as me. Now what was your other question? When Naruto heard he'd been forgiven for the question he'd asked, along with the advice she'd given about asking it, he calmed down happy that she wouldn't hurt him for asking it. He then asked the second question he wanted to know, you said that your last container was my mother, which means that you know who my parents are, please could you tell me who they were? Knowing that he'd have asked the question sooner or later, she replied, yes, I knew who your parents were. I knew your mother more than I knew your father for obvious reasons, the only things I knew about him were the things she'd say about him. Anyway your mother's name was Uzumaki Kashina, she was a woman well known for her beauty. Her skin was fair and her eyes were violet, she had a slender but highly feminine build with a low D cup sized bust and had long, vibrant red hair, which was a common trait amongst the members of the Uzumaki clan, that reached down to her calves, with strands that framed both sides of her face, with the left one being pinned by a hair clip. As an adult she usually wore a high-collared, sleeveless loose-fitting dress with a green apron over it, a black band on her left wrist and standard ninja sandals. When she'd first entered your village's ninja academy, she'd wanted to make a strong first impression and she proclaimed to her class that she would be the first female Hokage. The other kids laughed at her statement, and began calling her Tomato because of her thin round face and fiery red hair. This prompted her to lash out and pummel the kids who'd teased her. This, in addition to her red hair flowing wildly around, earned her the nickname of Akai Chishio no Habanero, Red Hot Blooded Habanero, and when she became a Kunoichi she'd earned the nickname Baradi Shinku no Akari, Bloody Crimson Fury, for her mastery and skill in Kenjutsu. She stopped here for a second knowing what she was about to tell him would be very shocking to him, but continued anyway, your father's name was Namikaze Minato, better known as the Yandaimi Hokage which I don't think I need to do any explaining on because you probably know a lot about him already, don't you? And she was hitting the nail right on the head. When Naruto had heard that his father was the Yandaimi Hokage he was extremely shocked, his idol and the greatest Hokage known was his father. Shortly after coming to terms with that he started to feel a little angry at the fact he'd sealed Kiyomi into him, he then realized that he was far too noble a person to seal her into another child if he couldn't do it with his own but that still didn't keep him from getting a good strong punch to the gut for what he did when they met again. When he was done thinking about it he asked Kiyomi, I don't blame him for what he did, but I'm still going to give him a good strong punch to the gut for it when I meet him again. Now, do you know how they met and fell in love with each other, Kiyomi? She was actually surprised he didn't hate his father, but then had to suppress her laughter at what he said he'd do when they met again. Anyway she decided to get to the new question he'd asked her and responded, Yes, I know how they first met, it was in the ninja academy when they first met each other. When Kashina first met him she thought he was nothing more than a wimp, which I had to agree with her on by the way he'd acted back then, but her and my opinion of him changed all in one night, one fateful night. Sometime after she arrived in and became a kunoichi of Konoha, Kashina was kidnapped by Kumogakir ninja who wanted to make use the special chakra she had, and as they escorted her to Kumo she'd secretly been plucking and leaving behind strands of her red hair to mark her trail in the hopes that someone would find her. Namikaze Minato, your father, was the only one to pick up on it, and after he'd rescued her from the Kumo ninja he told her that he had always admired the red hair she had. Since then Minato had proved to the both of us that he, himself was anything but a wimp, and that he liked the one thing she'd hated about herself, that's when your mother, Kashina, fell in love with him and was now considering her red hair as the Unmei no Akai Ito, red thread of fate, that had brought them together, and that's the major point in which they'd fallen in love with each other. When he heard how they'd fallen in love he'd thought it was very interesting, 
how she'd fallen for him after being rescued by him from Kumo Ninja whose intentions were probably not going to be good for her, but now that he'd gotten all of his current questions about his family answered he almost didn't know what to ask now. So he asked, Kiyomi. Why am I here in my mindscape? Kiyomi didn't really know either she'd usually just send her chakra to him when he was injured to help him recover, so she didn't really know what's going on outside because she couldn't unless he let her, but she did know that during the time she was sending her chakra to help heal him it had suddenly stopped accepting it. What she did know about it was that he was in a coma at this moment in time considering how she had slight access to how his body was functioning, so she'd responded, I'm really not too sure Naruto, I know that right now you're in a coma, but unfortunately I don't know why you are. I really am unsure of what do now with this mysterious predicament you're in or what the cause of it is, but I do know that whatever's happening might just be in your favor. Naruto didn't really know what to do when he heard he was in a coma for who knows how long with only Kiyomi as company not that he minded, but when he heard that this little situation he was now stuck inside, might actually be in his favor he decided that although he might be stuck here for a while it might just be worth it. Just as he was about to respond to what Kiyomi had just said he was interrupted by three heavenly voices in perfect synchronization with each other that said, Hello, Naruto-kun. As soon as he heard this he spun around to face where the voices came from and what he saw was three women who defined the word, Goddess. The three women in front of him almost looked like triplets for how alike they looked all three of them were 5 feet 6 inches in height with DD cup breasts with one of them having a high DD cup, they all had thigh length hair heart-shaped faces with button noses and luscious lips, they had curves in all the right places with lusciously long legs and an hourglass-shaped waist, and they were all barefoot, but that's where the similarities ended. The first woman's hair was a glossy silver color, her eyes were golden in color and she wore a golden-colored lipstick, her skin was a healthy pale color, and she wore a set of golden earrings with a sapphire orb in the center and a golden kimono with silver feathers along the bottom. The next woman was the one with the slightly larger bust she had black colored hair. Her eyes were a crimson red and she wore ruby red lipstick, her skin was a healthy mocha color, and she wore a set of golden earrings with a slit shaped ruby in the center and a black kimono that had red slash marks over it with the part covering her breasts opened at the top showing off a lot of her cleavage with part of her breasts and the parts on the side of both legs open all the way up to her waist showing off both of her luscious legs. The last woman of the three had brown hair. Her eyes were a beautiful emerald green and she wore an emerald green lipstick, her skin had a healthy tan coloration to it, and she wore a set of golden earrings with a leaf-shaped emerald in the center and a forest green kimono that had vines going all over it with different types and colors of flowers along them. They were goddesses in every sense of the word. He wasn't the only one checking them out Kiyomi was too and she had to say she was impressed by what she saw. She also noticed two more tattoos on Naruto that she couldn't see before they were both on his shoulder blades they were two upside down crescent shapes below an upside down triangle that was slightly inside of the them. Again Yusuke's Mizoku tattoos they're just hard to see because they're on his back. While they were checking them out the goddesses were also checking Naruto out and they were impressed with how handsome he looked now. What with all the changes to his body and the new additions, they had to say he was going to be a magnet for a lot of women when he woke up with both his new looks and his kind and caring personality. In fact if they said that they weren't attracted to him all three of them would be lying as all three of them felt a little hot under the collar and were trying to keep the blush that wanted to appear so badly right now from appearing. Once Naruto was done checking them out he decided to find out who they were and how they were here, who are you three goddesses and how are you here in my mindscape. Even though they were goddesses when he said that they couldn't keep the blush down any longer thus now all three of them wore a healthy shade of red on their cheeks, after a minute the silver-haired goddess spoke, well Naruto-kun how we're all in here is because the three of us are goddesses so entering a mindscape is no problem for us. Oh, my name's Kami by the way, goddess of light and these are my sisters go on and introduce yourselves. Shortly after she said that the mocha-skinned women spoke in a seductive voice, hey they're sexy I'm Yami goddess of darkness. So how would you like to make out with a goddess handsome? Naruto was now blushing bright red at the thought of it having seen it done by some people before, but before he could answer the final woman spoke up, Yami. Can't you control yourself? After saying that Yami said, what like you wouldn't do it if you had the chance? At this the woman blushed at the thought while Yami had a wide smile while holding up a victory sign, which Naruto found funny. After letting out a sigh of frustration at her Oni-chan's antics the woman spoke to Naruto saying, Please excuse my Oni-chan she's almost always like this. My name's Tozi by the way, goddess of nature. Both Kiyomi and Naruto, who was still blushing from Yami's comment, 
couldn't believe what they just heard the three most well-known goddesses were here in his mindscape. Naruto felt both embarrassed and honored at this, embarrassed for the fact that they were in this sewer that was his mindscape and honored that they would grace him with their presence. That's when the thought of why they're here popped into his mind for he knew they wouldn't be here for nothing, so he decided to voice it. Why are you three here Kami-sama, Yami-sama, Tozi-sama? Before Kami could speak of why they were here Yami beat her to the punch saying, Hey there Naruto-kun if you're going to add something to our names then it should be, Chan, it's annoying when people call me, Sama, plus it'd sound so much better coming from your mouth. Naruto's blush went back to its original shade of bright red at that, while Kami decided to get to the question he asked before Yami embarrassed the boy anymore and said, We're here because of what's happening to you Naruto-kun. You've just awakened the three greatest and most powerful Keke Jenke the elemental nations have ever known. It's the reason you're in this coma at the moment for you see these bloodlines haven't been awakened for many generations thus your body needs to adjust to it and that coupled with the malnourishment your body has means it will take a few years for you to wake up from this coma, not to mention you're the first to have all three of them together so we have no idea what will happen to you because of their union, but we'll check on your body as it changes to find out what will happen. Oh. By the way if you want to know what you'll look like when you wake up you can just look at yourself since your soul has already transformed your body just needs to catch up. Naruto deciding to do that looked at his arms and was a bit shocked at what he saw what with the change to them. His nails were now claws and he saw that his arms were now ripped along with his skin form fitted to his muscles giving it a rippled look and strange tattoos on them he looked at his chest and basically saw the same changes as with his arms he then noticed something out of the corner of his eye so he turned his head to see what it was and saw a brown monkey tail whose point of origin seemed to be from his backside. He continued to stare at it blankly for a moment before he shouted, I have a tail. When they heard that the women in the room couldn't help, but giggle at his reaction to it, Tozi after getting her giggling a bit under control she looked at Naruto who was still staring at his tail with slight shock at it and said, he 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 he, of course you have a tail silly it's one of the traits of one of the bloodlines you've activated, he he he, before she went back to her giggling at his reaction to it. Naruto got over his shock when he heard this, he then decided to find out what these bloodlines were and asked, so what are these powerful keke jenke that I've awakened? When they heard his question about his bloodlines they quickly got their giggling under control, Kiyomi too because she was curious about them as well, when Kami had stopped her giggling she said, okay we'll tell you about them now, but before we get to them we'll start off with explaining Keke Jenke and the three types that they're filed into, okay? Naruto nodded and Kami got to explaining them, Keke Jenke are abilities passed down genetically in specific clans. It's also possible for a person to have more than one of these abilities. Keke Jenke abilities that work via the user's eyes are called, Dojutsu. Other keke jenke include mixing one type of elemental chakra with another, creating a new one unique to the users, which is usually impossible for normal ninja to do also keke jenke and their related techniques cannot be taught to or copied by others. However, keke jenke can be given to others, a dojutsu for example can be transplanted into the body of another. Use of these organs requires much more chakra than someone born with a keke jenke, causing them to keep them covered in a dojutsu's case. Chakra elements can also be passed down to people outside of the clan by going through DNA remodification to acquire their unique elemental release technique, though this is very dangerous and their skill in using it is not nearly as powerful as the original practitioner. Although Keke Jenke are usually genetically shared within a specific clan, sometimes it is unique to one person alone, and that even family relatives do not share it, such as the Mokaton, wood release, that was used by Konoha's Shodai Hokage and the Shikatsumyaku dead bone pulse, of the Kagaya clan. Yet other Keke Jenke seem to appear in individuals with no known relation, such as the Yotan, lava release, which has appeared in ninja from both Kirigakure and Iwagakure, and Jishin, magnet release, which has appeared in ninja from both Kumogakure and Sanagakure, with me so far. Naruto nodded interested to learn more seeing as he hardly learned much besides what he learned on the streets which wasn't much, after seeing this she continued, all keke jenke are filtered into three basic types them being body type, chakra type, and eye type otherwise known as dojutsu. The shikatsumyaku is an example of a body type keke jenke which gives them the ability to manipulate their bone structure by infusing their calcium with chakra and this allows them to manipulate the growth and density of their bones making their entire bodies a weapon. The sharingan and byakugan are examples of eye type keke jenke. 
The Sharingan of the Uchiha clan for example allows those able to activate it to see through and copy any ninjutsu. Genjutsu, or Taijutsu as long as they are not another bloodline's ability it also gives them the ability to predict their opponent's moves and has two more levels that give them even greater abilities. While the Byakugan of the Hyuga clan however gives the user a near 360 field of vision it's also able to see through solid objects with a degree of telescopic sight that can be improved and its greatest ability is the ability to see chakra the chakra flow as well as the chakra circulation system inside the body with great detail and this allows them to see through genjutsu, and all elemental combination techniques are examples of chakra type keke jenke. Then there are the more advanced versions of these types called transcended keke jenke these types are basically the progenitors to some or all keke jenke of that type. Now that you know all that I'll get on to your keke jenke. The three keke jenke you have are each one of the three types that I just explained to you and they are also the first transcended keke jenke meaning that all other keke jenke were born from them, get all that? Naruto nodded yet again both shocked and amazed that he had all three of the first known bloodlines in the world, after his nod she continued, now I'll get on to their names, types, and how they were born, got it? He nodded, okay the first one I'll explain is your body type bloodline, its name is, master of the body. It was born from a great man and alien from a warrior race called Saiyans he was one of the last of his kind after his home planet was destroyed by a tyrannical ruler who had used them as his soldiers until he grew fearful of their power and destroyed them. Luckily for him he was launched from the planet before it happened. He landed here on earth as a baby, he was then found and taken in by an old man named Gohan who raised him as his own and named him Goku. As he grew he became one of the greatest heroes on earth saving it several times from aliens that wanted to destroy it including killing the alien responsible for destroying his home planet. During this time there were seven magical balls called dragon balls that if a person collected all seven they could call upon the eternal dragon Shenron to grant them one wish and after granting that wish the seven dragon balls would then scatter across the world and remain dormant for a year before they could be used again. But what no one knew about them was if they were overused the negative energy that's collected by them granting a wish would cause the balls to crack under the pressure of their own negative energy and could cause great destruction if used after they've cracked, for you see they were intended to be a thing of extraordinary magic and power something to be revered not for the ease of their method, but for the dream of never having to use them. This event had happened and Goku helped stop it before it could cause the great destruction that would have happened and after it was over Shenron had to separate the dragon balls from the earth for a very long time. Goku went with him and became the guardian of the Dragon Balls, he later returned to Earth having gained his bloodline during his time away and when he returned he found out all of his descendants had died while he was away, later on he fell in love with another woman and with her help they gave birth to the Sun Clan. Naruto was amazed at his ancestor and how great he was, Kami after her little breather continued, the next one is your chakra type bloodline, its name is, Master of the Spirit. It was born from a young man named Yurameshi Yusuke who became a human demon hybrid with the demon part of his biology being a Mizoku. He was only 14 years old when his journey began it was also the day he first died. Naruto went wide eyed at that, he was given new life by King Enma's son Jr. Normally referred to as Koenma and then became a spirit detective to fight against demons for him. He had many cases and on his first one he got two friends who were once enemies, on his last case to stop a man from completing his goal of opening a tunnel to demon world he was killed again and it was also when he found out he was part Mizoku demon. For you see all Mizoku demons have a special trait called the atavism of the Mizoku, you see an atavism is when a trait recurs in a descendant after skipping generations this can even result in a reversion to the primitive characteristics of a remote ancestor. The atavism of the Mizoku, or half-breed, is an extreme example the Mizoku can deliberately transmit its DNA recessively until it reaches an heir strong enough to succeed it and after he awakened as a half-demon, he went to demon world to finish what the two of them started and near the end of their battle his ancestral dad took over and defeated the man. After that he returned to human world and stayed there for a short while before returning to demon world where he found out who his ancestral father was and he was none other than the demon king Ryzen. Shortly after Ryzen died Yusuke started a great tournament where the winner would be crowned king, queen of demon world for a time until they all get back together and do it over again, the winner of the first tournament was an old friend of Ryzen called Anki and made an absolute law to leave humans in peace, though some demons still mess with them from time to time, and that his term would only be three years. Yusuke then returned to human world two years after it unknowingly having gained his bloodline and married his sweetheart, 
Yukimura Keiko and together they started the Urameshi clan. Naruto was also amazed with his second ancestor and how he like his first ancestor was a great hero except instead of defending the earth from aliens he defended it from demons. Kiyomi was shocked and amazed as well for she knew who Yusuke was and that she was sealed into one of his descendants was in a way an honor for her. As soon as Kami saw he was ready she continued, last, but not least is your eye type bloodline, its name is. The Omnigan. Unlike your other two bloodlines this one was not born, but created by me and my sisters, Yami and Tozi. When we finished creating it we knew it was too powerful to give to any mortal and even their descendants could misuse it, but we didn't want our hard work to go to waste so we put two locks on it one for its activation and the second for its final level to be unlocked. After doing that we created a human who could use it to its full potential so we could see it in action and gave him the name Tenchi. He became the most influential man in history by taking in and training an orphan in all he knew of chakra, that orphan then went on to become the man known as the Rakuto Senen, the supposed discoverer of chakra when in fact it was discovered by the three clans you descended from, who had taught others how to use chakra and he'd also gifted him with his dojutsu. The Rinnegan. Tenchi was also the founder of the Namikaze clan. Naruto was again amazed that his last ancestor was the father figure and sensei of the Rakuto Senen, the man his Gigi talked about as being the founder of the ninja world. He then noticed that she hadn't told him why they hadn't activated before now and how he got his body and chakra type bloodline so he asked, so how did I get the body and chakra type bloodline my last name Zuzumaki not son or Urameshi and are you going to tell me why they hadn't activated earlier? Kami then answered, I was getting to that. You see the Uzumaki clan was born from the union of a son and Urameshi clan member. The clan had gotten both the bloodlines and the abilities that they had, but through the years they stopped activating the bloodlines and only had some of the abilities that the bloodlines had after they stopped activating them. The reason for you not activating them earlier is because of your chakra type bloodline, you see the only way to activate it is to be strong enough to activate it and die. His eyes widened at that and yelled, I died. Kami replied, yes in a way. You see you were dying when you were taken to the hospital and it was just enough for it to activate, but we're getting off track so let me finish what I was saying now where was I? Oh yeah why the others didn't activate? They didn't activate because when you were born all three of them had combined and that one was keeping the others from activating, got it? He nodded still shocked that he'd died in a way, then thought about its requirements for activation and asked, yeah I understand, but I'm just a kid how could I have been strong enough to activate it? Kami smiled at that and answered, because of Kiyomi there being sealed in you, most of the users of that bloodline had to be at least 15 or 16 years old to be strong enough to activate it, but because of her chakra leaking into your body it made it strong enough to activate it and the others activated with it because you had the requirements for them to activate. What were their requirements? He asked. Kami answered, the body bloodline is active since birth and the Omnigan can only be activated by a person with pure intentions and a pure heart. After Kami answered his question, Yami started walking up to him with a seductive sway to her hips and when she reached him she went around behind him and draped her arms around his shoulders pulling him to her with his head touching her breasts. When she did that his bright red blush returned and she got jealous glares from Kiyomi, Kami, and Tozi, though she couldn't see Kiyomi's, she just smirked at them then said seductively into his ear, now it's time to tell you why we're here besides just telling you about your bloodlines. You see we're here to take you to a special training dimension we've created for you to be trained in. Because of all of the potential you have we just couldn't stand by and let it all go to waste with you just sitting here waiting for yourself to wake up. Once Naruto got enough of his embarrassment under control to talk he asked, why? Why would you three goddesses do that for me? Tozi, though still angry at the position her sister was in with Naruto, replied, we're helping you for two reasons. The first is because we feel responsible for what's happened to you because of having Kiyomi sealed into you by our brother Shinigami and your treatment after the fact, and two so that you can help the world with the three great Keke Jenke that you have. So you're doing this for because you feel responsible for what's happened to me so far and want to make amends for it, along with allowing me to become a great hero like two of my ancestors? He asked. Yami then asked, replied, yep pretty much. So how about it you want to get started on becoming a great hero or do you want just to stay here and wait to wake up? Of course I'll do it not only because I want to become a hero just like my ancestors, but because I'm not waiting here bored out of my mind waiting to wake up. I'd go insane from that, doing training I'd at least have something to do than just sit around waiting, he replied. Good, we'll leave immediately so that you can meet your instructors and then begin your training, Kami said as she opened up a portal to the training dimension and started to walk toward it. 
Before they left they had Kiyomi yell of, Oi wait, don't just leave me to wait here with no one to talk to. Can't I come with you so that I won't be bored waiting here for you to come back? Kami thought about it for a moment before saying, Sure as long as it's okay with Naruto-kun. She then looked at him to see he nod as he replied, She can come along. After getting his response Kami walked up to the cage and put her hand on the gate. A second after she touched it, it started to glow as it shrunk into a small glowing blue orb that then shot to Kiyomi's neck and formed a black collar around it with the kanji for, seal, on the front of it. With her work done she then said, All right now that you're free to walk around let's get going. After that the five of them walked through the portal to arrive in the training dimension. Training dimension. After exiting the portal Naruto and Kiyomi were amazed. They'd appeared in a large building that had room for at least ten people to stay comfortably they could see the kitchen and several doors that they guessed were bedrooms and directly in front of them was a large opening into an area that was completely white that they'd guessed was the training area. If you haven't guessed it's similar to the hyperbolic time chamber from Dragon Ball Z, along with how the building looks from the outside just a bit bigger and with some changes. Well, do you want the tour or would you like to meet your senseis? Tozi asked when she saw they were done examining the immediate area. Naruto after thinking about it for a little bit answered, I think I'd like the tour first before I meet my senseis. Yami then replied, All right then follow us. After that they went through the tour starting with the kitchen which was very large and doubled as a dining room and it had everything you'd need for making anything you wanted. Next they visited the library which was so huge that it had a second floor and it was filled with all sorts of books and scrolls on everything. After that they visited the bedrooms, where the restrooms were and then after that the very large bathroom that was extremely amazing and very luxurious. They were now headed to the meeting room where he would meet his senseis. As soon as they entered the room Naruto and Kiyomi five silhouettes, four male and one female, standing at the back of the room in the shadows. After they observed them Kami said, as she walked up to the first silhouette on the left, now that we're done touring the place for the next couple of years, I do believe it's time for you to meet your five main senseis. Main senseis? Oh yes we forgot to mention that you may have other senseis brought here to teach you, but anyway back to where we were, introducing your main senseis to you. We'll start from the left and go to the right, starting with this man here who'll be the first to be introduced, Namikaze Tenchi. After saying that said man stepped out of the shadows and started walking toward Naruto who got a good look at him while he was, he was six feet tall sapphire blue eyes with long spiky golden blonde hair that reached just below his shoulder blades and was tied in a low ponytail. He was wearing a gold and blue jacket over a yellow shirt with black pants and shoes. When he reached him he put a hand on his shoulder and said, Hey there Naruto it's good to meet you. I hope we can get to know each other very well during your time here and I hope you enjoy what we're going to be teaching you. It's extremely nice to meet you. I hope we do too and I definitely know I'm going to enjoy what you all are going to teach me. Naruto said after which he hugged the man who chuckled slightly, but returned the hug. Naruto after he finished the hug turned back to Kami for her to introduce the other four, though he had a pretty good idea that two of them were his other ancestors. Alright next we have the demonic spirit detective, Yurameshi Yusuke. Again after Kami finished the next man stepped out of the shadows and walked toward him. This man was 5 feet 9 inches with black slicked back hair and brown slitted eyes. He was wearing a red jacket with yellow tinted cuffs and collar over a white shirt, along with jeans and white shoes. When he reached him he crouched down to his level and said, Hey kid it's nice to meet the person that these goddesses seem to favor. Anyway hope you do well with all our training and don't die in the process. After hugging this man as well, who returned it with a smile, he replied, It's extremely nice to meet you, too. I also really want to get to know you after what I've heard about you. Oh, and you were just kidding about the dying part, right? The slightly evil grins he got from both Tenchi and Yusuke, along with the ones he could feel from the other three, proved that they weren't and it made him slightly nervous, but then he became determined to not give up no matter how hard it was, which seemed to cause them to smile at him when they saw the determined look on his face. So he turned to Kami for her to continue the introductions, next we have the Saiyan protector of Earth, Son Goku. Then the next man began walking to Naruto he was six feet tall with spiky black hair and black eyes. He was wearing a blue GI with ochre pants with a white sash going over his waist and sports faded red wristbands and was wearing black shoes with white shin coverings. When he reached him he knelt down and pulled him into a hug, which Naruto quickly returned, when they finished he said, Hello Naruto it's great to meet you and I hope you enjoy your time here learning from us. It's extremely nice to meet you also and I know I will. 
I'd also like to get to know you well after what I've heard about you, too, was his reply before turning to Kami again. Kami seeing his look to continue did so knowing this next one would get more of a reaction than the others, next is the Bharati Shinku no Akari and your mother, Uzumaki Kashina. And she was right before she was even finished talking Naruto had already run up to Kashina and was hugging her as if his life depended on it with tears free flowing from him. Kashina who was hugging him back had begun crying as well and around the room everyone had soft expressions on their faces with the goddesses all having watery eyes and Kiyomi openly crying at the scene. After hugging for a few minutes Naruto released her and backed up to get a good look at her and that she looked just how Kiyomi had described her, but that didn't do it justice unless you saw her for yourselves. She was 5 feet 4 inches with long crimson hair that reached down to her calves with strands that framed both sides of her face with the left one being pinned by a hair clip and beautiful violet eyes. She had a slender but highly feminine build with a low D cup sized bust and was wearing a dark blue high collared, sleeveless loose fitting dress with a black band on her left wrist and standard ninja sandals. Hello Sochi it's so nice see you again after so long. That she'd said after their hug with tears in her eyes. Naruto after wiping his tears away with his sleeve replied, It's good to see you again, too, Ka-san. After his reply she pulled him into a hug again for a few seconds before letting him go and when she released him he turned to Kami. Kami knew that this last person would not get a reaction as heartfelt as the one they'd just witnessed, but would introduce him anyway and watch the fireworks, last, but definitely not least the Konoha no Kiroi Sanko, Yellow Flash of the Leaf, and your father, Namikaze Minato. When he was introduced Naruto turned to the man walking to him and saw that Minato looked similar to how he used to look. He was 5 feet 9 inches with bright blue eyes and spiky blonde hair and unlike Naruto. Minato had jaw length bangs framing either side of his face. His attire was a standard Konoha Nin uniform with two bands each on both of his sleeves, a flak jacket and a hitai ate over that he was wearing a short sleeved long white trench coat decorated by flame-like motifs on the edges, with the kanji for Yandaimi Hokage written vertically down the back, and closed on the front by a thin orange rope. When he reached Naruto before he could say anything he received an extremely strong, for a five-year-old that is, punch to the stomach that caused his knees to buckle and him to lose his breath. That's for sealing Kiyomi into me and making my life a living hell. Around the room this caused different reactions, Kiyomi was laughing her ass off and glad that she was here to see that, the goddesses were giggling with Yami laughing her ass off with Kiyomi, Tenchi, Yusuke, and Goku were a little confused at first before they heard what it was for then they started laughing as well, and Kashina just had a large amused smirk on her face while thinking of how Naruto acted a bit like her. When Minato regained his breath he opened his mouth to speak and tell him why he did it, but Naruto beat him to it and said, I know why you did what you did, that's for the pain it caused me, but it's still good to see you too San. When he finished what he was saying he hugged Minato who returned it and responded, It's good to see you too Sochi. When they'd finished hugging Tozi spoke saying, Alright now that introductions are done we can get down to planning his training schedule for both his basic and advanced training. After Tozi was finished Goku stepped up and said, I think some of the first things he should work on is reading and writing along with some physical and spiritual training along some training to get rid of the weaknesses my bloodline has. Your bloodline has weaknesses. Naruto asked. Yes. Was Goku's response as he walked over to Naruto and when he reached him he quickly grabbed his tail, as soon as he did Naruto felt incredibly weak as if when his tail was grabbed all of his energy was drained with it. This is one of the two weaknesses it has whenever your tail is grabbed it will make you weak and an easy target for those who are willing to exploit it. When he was done explaining it Goku released Naruto's tail who returned to normal as soon as it was released, after which he asked. You said that was just the first of two weaknesses the bloodline has? Yes, that was its first, but don't worry both of them can be gotten rid of with training. The weaknesses themselves are centered around the tail and can be gotten rid of two ways one is training to get rid of them and two is to just cut the tail off except doing the second option will make you weaker than you are with it, but because of what the bloodline can do we can't do that so we'll just have to train them out of you. Anyway the first one, the one you just felt, is the easiest to get rid of the second one is not. The second one will only happen when you see the full moon and it's both a strength and a weakness for you see when you see the moon your power will increase quite a bit and you'll transform into a giant ape that, until you get control, will go on a rampage destroying everything in sight with just instinct alone. Goku explained. After hearing the second weakness he had to agree that it was one. I mean if you can get stronger, but can't control anything you do when you get it what's the point in having it? 
after hearing what Goku had said and coming to that conclusion responded, alright so let's get to training so that we can get rid of them and get that other stuff started as well. After hearing that they decided to plan the rest of his training later and get started on his current training right now and Yusuke responded, alright then let the tour, I mean training begin. Hearing what he was about to say made Naruto feel slightly nervous again. Hokage's office, 4 p.m., October 11th, in his office currently doing his daily paperwork was Serutobi Hirazan the Sandame Hokage, but besides doing his paperwork he was also thinking about what's happening to Naruto. When he'd heard the explanation from Hiroshi he was a bit surprised that they could no longer feel the Kiyubi's chakra coming from the boy since whenever he was injured, no matter how small, you could always feel some from him as it healed him. While he was thinking deeply about this and its meaning, two Hyugas were making their way to his office. They were Hiyashi and Hinata, while the older of the two was just holding his daughter's hand as he walked her to the office, while his daughter was holding some flowers in her free hand. When they both reached the door Hiyashi knocked and waited for the Hokage's reply to enter. Hiruzen while slightly startled by the knock composed himself and replied, come in. When they heard his reply Hiyashi opened the door and they both entered. When Hiruzen saw them both he said, ah, Hiyashi and Hanada I'm guess that you're both here so that we can go visit Naruto and what a lovely bouquet of flowers you have there Hanada. Hanada who blushed at the compliment to her flower selection replied with a quiet, thank you. And the flowers were beautiful but one of flowers in particular caught Hiruzen's attention and it was the one in the center of the bouquet. The flower itself was a thornless lavender rose he knew the meaning of that flower and it meant, love at first sight, that caused him to smile. After getting her reply Hiruzen stood up and walked around his desk before saying to Hanada, Hanada before we go I want you to know that if you want to visit him again you'll have to come here so that I'm with you when you visit him, because there are people who wish to hurt him and I don't want anyone to impersonate you to hurt him can you please promise me that? Hanada while a little shocked that someone would do that to hurt him nonetheless replied, I promise. Alright then let's get going. And with Hiruzen's response the three began making their way to the hospital. Konoha Hospital, outside Naruto's room, 4.20 pm. Upon reaching the door Hiyashi and Hanada saw that two Anbu were guarding the door walking up to them Hiruzen greeted them, Karasu-san, Tora-san. With them responding, Hokage-sama. After their brief greeting Hiruzen put his hand on the doorknob and deactivated the special locking seal before opening the door. Upon entering they all saw Naruto, with no whisker marks anymore, hooked up to several machines and the beeping of the heart monitor, Hanada started to get teary-eyed at the sight. She then released her father's hand and walked over to Naruto's bedside where she placed her flowers for him on the bedside table before reaching out and taking hold of his right hand. After she did that she said, H hello again na Naruto k kun i k n no you pro probably can't he hear me re right now, b you but I just wa wanted to thank yo you for re-rescuing me last knee night and th that I ho hope you wa wake up so soon so that I, I can thank yo you prop properly. Hiyashi after hearing his daughter's thank you brought a chair from the nearby table over behind her so that she could sit beside him before he said, I'd also like to thank you for saving my daughter Naruto if it weren't for you I doubt I would have ever seen her again. So please wake up soon so that I can thank you in person for I have never seen one so young be so brave especially given the condition you were in before saving her. After saying his piece he walk over to the table where Hiruzen was sitting and sat down next to him. A few minutes pass when Hiroshi came in, having heard Hiruzen was here, before walking over to him and saying, Hokage-sama I have an update to report on Naruto's condition that you should hear. That got the attention of everyone and at hearing this Hiruzen asked, can you report it here or does this need to be done in private? Hearing that Hiruzen replied, it can be done here if you want, but I think we should do this in private. Before giving a side long glance to Hanada with both Hiruzen and Hiyashi seeing it and knowing what it meant. Hiyashi after seeing it asked, is it alright if I go with you so I can hear it as well? Hiroshi replied, yes Hiyashi sama it would be alright for you to hear it. After hearing that Hiruzen stood up before walking over to Hiroshi and said, alright then let's go to your office so that we can hear your report. Hanada do you think you can stay here and keep Naruto-kun here company? Hanada upon hearing this nodded her head, seeing this Hiyashi stood and walked over to Hiroshi and Hiruzen before saying, we'll be back in a little while okay Hanada. Okay. After hearing her reply they left the room heading to Hiroshi's office. Immediately after they'd left Hanada turned back to Naruto and said, this is my oh other thank you G gift. I just co couldn't do it with my f father in the Hokage while watching and after she said that she kissed him on the cheek before returning to her seated position blushing up a storm. 
Konoha Hospital, Hiroshi's office, 4.26 p.m. Upon everyone entering the room Hiroshi closed the door and put up a privacy barrier then went to his desk and sat down before turned to the other two people in the room, who'd already sat down, and said, well Hokage-sama, Hiyashi-sama, there has been no change on any of the tests we've run so far, but we'll be continuing to do them every so often as we've already informed you of Hokage-sama. While that was the first thing I wanted to report an update on this next one is a bit strange, but after we started giving him IV nourishment the signs of malnourishment that he had along with a few other things that was wrong with his body from abuse over the year started repairing themselves. It's slow, but faster than it should be happening and while the fixing of the malnourishment was no surprise to any of us the fixing of the other things wrong with him were. Upon hearing this both occupants of the room were surprised by it before Hirazan asked, does this have anything to do with then Kiyubi, and if not then what's your opinion on this new turn of events? Not missing a beat Hiroshi answered, besides the little bit of the Kiyubi's chakra that we felt when you brought him in last night sir, no there hasn't been any more of its chakra in his system. Which is a bit odd because no matter what he always has a small barely detectable bit of its chakra in his system. Anyway my opinion on it is that his body is healing any and all damage to it before it starts going through some very big changes or it could just be fixing itself, but I think it's going to be the former of those two, at least that's my best guess given what I have to go on. After hearing his explanation Hiyashi asked, so that's your best take on what's happening to Naruto? Yes it is Hiyashi-sama, was Hiroshi's reply. Serutobi then asked, how long do you think it will take for his body to be back in perfect condition for it to start to make these changes that you think it will do? Hiroshi took up a thinking pose for a few seconds before answering, my best estimation given the rate it's repairing itself is about 6 months give or take, but it will take around that long for it to finish fixing his body. After that I don't know how long it will take to finish doing whatever it'll be doing after that or if it'll change anything about his body at all. After hearing this Hiruzen thought about what he should do and if he should call both Naruto's godmother and godfather, but after a bit of contemplation he decided to do it and responded, alright continue monitoring him and when I return to my office I'll be contacting Jiraiya to find Tsunade and bring her back so that she can help when he begins to change if he starts to do that after 6 months alright? Hiroshi was immediately surprised when Hiruzen said he was calling in Tsunade and knew it had to be very serious if he was going to do that, so he responded, yes sir and may I just say it will be an honor to be working with her when she arrives. After which Hiroshi removed the barrier and then Hiruzen and Hiyashi left before briefly stopping at Naruto's room to get Hanada, who was blushing when they arrived, then left the hospital before going their separate ways with Hiruzen heading to his office and once he got there he began writing two scrolls the first one was just a message to Jiraiya to find Tsunade and then when he found her to read the second scroll that he'd sealed in the first aloud which contained the current situation with Naruto and that he was calling Tsunade back to the village immediately. After rolling up the scroll and sending it on its way he began to think of how they'd take the news. Oh. Who was he kidding he knew what their reaction would be and that was extremely pissed off he'd be lucky just to get yelled at what with him knowing that Tsunade tended to get rather physical when she was pissed and he unfortunately knew how pissed she'd be. He then winced slightly remembering the last time she was that pissed and how she nearly beat Jiraiya to death, oh yes he'd be lucky just getting yelled at a lot. Training Dimension, Total Training Time, 1 Month, 3 Days. Naruto was currently lying on his bed cursing his senseis they were relentless and he now gets why Yusuke said they hope he didn't die. The only time he got to rest was when he doing bookwork and sleeping, though he only got 7 hours of that, during the rest of his time he was doing what he called hardcore training with Goku, Yusuke, and Tenchi only they called it light training. Anyway the schedule was get up at 4.30am where he then began a brief warm up run around the different areas of the training field where he saw that it was different than how he imagined it for you see he only saw the default of the area for you see it could actually be changed to anything depending on the training you wanted to do, but anyway back to where we were. After his brief warm up he then picked up a 20 pound lead weight then skipped for 3 miles. Then while still carrying the weight zigzagged between trees of a tree lined path for 2 miles. Then he climbed up a winding set of steps on a mountain all the way to the top of it while carrying the weight, then he carried it across a tree trunk over a ravine, he then carried it across a desert of sand that he was slightly sinking into, then he carried it across a raging river, after that he was chased by a large lizard-like animal with very sharp teeth, T-Rex, just waiting to eat him while carrying the weight, and Goku said that all of this was only his early morning exercise. After that he began his mid-morning exercise which consisted of tilling fields bare-handed and Goku saying that the fields he'd till would be increased every day. 
When he'd finished that they took a break and had breakfast, after which he hit the books with his Ka San, Kashina, until lunchtime and when they'd finished they had lunch. They'd finish lunch around 12.30 p.m. after which he'd get to take an hour-long nap to rejuvenate himself. After his nap he was taken by Yusuke to begin his mid-afternoon training which consisted of both physical and spiritual training with the physical part being about balance and muscle size while the spiritual part was him balancing on a spike upside down on one finger with nothing, but Reiki, spirit energy, keeping in that position. After that Goku would take him again and then had to do 10 laps, at first, across a large lake. He'd thought this would be easy and a bit of a break for him, until he found out he'd have to be out swimming a large shark that was trying to eat him as well. After that he'd be taken by Tenchi and his father, Minato, for dodging practice after which he'd be with Goku again training to get rid of his tail grabbing weakness, though he got rid of that a week into his training and would be starting on the other after six months of training. Then when he'd finished that he went to sleep only to begin it again the next day. If that wasn't enough he also had to wear 100 pounds worth of weight in the form of a weighted shirt with weighted wristbands and shoes and Goku said he'd be upping each of the weights by 20 every month for one year so this month he was now wearing 200 pounds of weight. Goku had said that in one year they'd be getting rid of them then and replacing them with weight seals and will also be adding resistance and gravity seals as well. Not to mention that they boosted his workload every day by increasing everything he did the day before making the fields he runs get longer while the mountains he climbed got taller and so on. Although the training he was doing was hard Naruto knew that it'd all be worth it when he returned to his body and he couldn't wait because he knew when he did return he'd be extremely strong by then. Tanzaku Gai, one week later, 1 p.m., Jiraiya, who was currently looking for Tsunade, was a tall man about 6 feet 3 inches in height with waist length, spiky white hair he usually had tied back into a ponytail, with two shoulder-length bangs that framed both sides of his face with a noticeable wart on the right side of his nose. He had red lines that ran down from his eyes and wore a horned forehead protector with the kanji for, oil, which denoted his affiliation with the toads of Mount Myoboku. He wore a green short shirt kimono and matching pants, under which he wore mesh armor that showed out of the sleeves and legs of his outfit. His outfit was completed with handguards, a simple black belt, traditional Japanese geta, wooden sandals, a red cloak with two simple yellow circles, and a scroll on his back, he also had a tattoo on his left palm. He had been a bit confused when he'd received scroll from his old sensei a week ago that had just told him to find Tsunade and when he did to read the scroll that was sealed into the scroll aloud to Tsunade. He found it a bit odd to suddenly be searching for his old teammate, but he couldn't wait to see her given how long it's been since they've seen each other. A few times during his search he'd wondered about what the scroll said, but he continued to focus on finding Tsunade knowing he'd find out when he did. It had taken him a while to track her down to here, but considering how bad of a gambler she is and how she's always running from debt collectors he wasn't surprised though he was surprised it didn't take longer to find her. As soon as Jiraiya entered the city he began his search in the places she'd most likely be found starting with the casinos and gambling pits. After searching all of them he decided to start with the bars, hopefully finding her in one of them, and if he comes up empty there he'll try the hotels. Upon entering the sixth bar he found her sitting at a table with her apprentice Shizun who was holding her small pet pig Tauntin, but with them was a young woman he'd never seen before. Tsunade was a fairly tall light-skinned woman about 5 feet 4 inches in height with light brown eyes and straight blonde hair, her hair was waist length with shoulder length bangs framing both sides of her face. She had a violet rhombus mark on her forehead and while she's only in her early 40s, she maintains the appearance of her younger self through a unique and constant transformation technique. She has a sizable bust of high D, low D D cup breasts and wore a grass green robe with the kanji for gamble, written in black on the back, inside a red circle. Underneath she was wearing a grey, kimono style blouse with no sleeves, held closed by a broad, dark bluish grey obi that matches her pants and her blouse was closed quite low, revealing her sizable cleavage. She was wearing open-toed sandals with high heels and polish on both her fingernails and toenails and she was also wears a soft pink lipstick the Shodai Hokage no Kabikazari, first Hokage's necklace, which had a special green crystal gem in the center of it which was flanked on both sides by a tiny metal ball, in clear view on her chest, altogether she was very beautiful woman with several people often being called the most beautiful kunoichi in the world. Sitting next to her was Shizun who was 5 feet 4 inches with shoulder length black hair with bangs and onyx eyes. She had a high C cup sized bust and was wearing a long bluish black kimono with white trimmings, 
held closed by a white obi, and open-toed sandals with low heels. Taunton, the pig she was holding, was a light pinkish color much like any other pig with her cheeks blushing in a darker shade of the same pink as her skin and she was wearing a pearl collar with a dark red jacket. The last person there was around 4 feet 9 inches had the appearance of a slender and very youthful girl, who looked to be in her mid-teens, who had a gentle and warm appearance with blue eyes and long black thigh-length hair styled in front of her in a loose ponytail. She seemed to have a low D-cup-sized bust and was wearing a kimono like Shizun's except hers was a dark blue with white trimmings that was also held closed by a white obi and over it she was wearing a white haori that had small dark blue slits at the bottom with one small dot of the same color between each slit. She also appeared to have a katana with a red string attached to the sheath so that it could be carried over her shoulder. Yes it's a Captain Howry just without the number on the back. After inspecting the last person of the group Jiraiya walks toward them before greeting. Hello Tsunade. Shizun how are you doing and who's this lovely young girl you're with? When Jiraiya was finished he'd taken a seat across from them. Tsunade you could tell was not happy that Jiraiya was here and him eyeing her second apprentice didn't helping her mood either, but replied, we're fine Jiraiya and as for the girl she's my second apprentice you know Hana Retsu. After she was introduced Retsu responded, it's an honor to meet you Jiraiya-sama. When Yuno Hana finished Tsunade asked the question that she wanted answered, now what are you doing here Jiraiya? I doubt you're just here by coincidence. Jiraiya was a bit shocked when he heard Tsunade say she took on another apprentice, but quickly got over it when he heard Retsu's greeting and before he could respond to it Tsunade asked him her question. After hearing the question he responded, first it's nice to meet you Retsu-san and Tsunade I'm surprised that you've taken on another apprentice. Now as for why I'm here, I was told to find you by sensei then read this scroll, here he pulled the scroll from his kimono shirt, to you. When she heard this said, well what are you waiting for pervert read it. After her response Jiraiya opened the scroll then cleared his throat and said, alright here we go, dear Tsunade and Jiraiya, I'm writing this letter because something's happened that concerns you too. This is why I'm ordering Tsunade to return to the village. Jiraiya heard sound the sound of a glass shattering, but didn't look up knowing the sound was of Tsunade crushing her sake saucer at the news, now I know that you're mad at this Tsunade, but you know that I wouldn't do this unless it was important. Now for the reason that it concerns you both is that it's about your godson Naruto. At hearing Jiraiya's slight pause she wondered why he did it until she heard her godson's name. You're both probably wondering what's happened to him which I'll give you the full details on when you get here, but as of right now he's in a coma. Now I know you're probably surprised at that and so was I when I'd heard, but besides that shock there is more it appears that something is happening with his body. I'm writing this after the doctor, Hiroshi, reported that his body was repairing itself without the help of his condition and that they haven't felt anything from it since he was brought in last night. So I ask that you return quickly Tsunade for the doctor I spoke with said that his body was doing it to either get his body back in perfect condition then stop or get it to perfect condition and then start changing it, which he thinks will be the latter rather than the former. Also before I end this letter I want to just say how sorry I am for not being able to protect your godson from the villagers better and for not reporting this to you too, but anyway I'll tell you more when you get here. I'd also like to say to Tsunade that I'm truly sorry I didn't inform you that Naruto's mother, Kashina, had died the same night he was born. I know I'm going to get it when you return, but I'll take the punishment you give me because I know that I deserve it. Serutobi Hirazan, Sandame Hokage. Well Hirazan was right about one thing Tsunade and Jiraiya were pissed, though Tsunade more than Jiraiya. A few seconds after Jiraiya finished Tsunade stood, then turned to her apprentices and said, come on Shizun, Retsu we're getting our things and heading to Konoha, I've got an old monkey to deal with. After which was Jiraiya's reply of, I'm coming to Konoha with you I've got some choice things to say to that old man. After which they all left the bar with one destination in mind, Konoha. The end. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.